So one of the things that is fascinating to me is the fact that Tolkien himself was a notorious fiddler, uh, which means he was someone who was never pleased with the finished work. He was constantly fiddling with things and changing things. He would get a version published. He would go back a couple of years later and say, oh, I don't like that. I've, I've come up with some better ideas over here. Um, I want to go ahead and revise that work. And so they would get a new edition out. Meanwhile, he would continue to take notes. He would continue to flesh things out. He would continue to write other stories and then co come back to things and say, oh, I don't like that. The equivalent of this is George Lucas. And George Lucas has taken a lot of flack in the modern era for changing things. A good example of this is how you have uh, Han Solo shooting Greedo first in the cantina scene in uh, episode four, A New Hope, and then coming back years later with the enhanced editions and suddenly Greedo shoots first. And you have this outrage from the fan base because no that's not my han solo han solo shot first george lucas you suck and suddenly you have this vitriol towards the creator of many people's favorite franchise which brought up a question in a recent video i did someone saying that how do you think tolkien would be received in the current era uh, regarding how he was constantly fiddling with things and changing his own works. Do you think that would be well received or do you think there would be an outrage like there is an outrage against George R. R. Martin, an outrage against Patrick Rothfuss, an, out, uh, you know, an outrage against George Lucas, an outrage against Stephen King even, these writers who go into these franchises they've written that are really big and they get show adaptations or they continually are tweaking things and revising things and changing things. And you have fans who have become, you know, endeared to a certain version of things. And that, that, that got me thinking is like, I think in the era that we live in, I think that Tolkien would very much be reviled by a certain group of fans much like George Lucas was and is for going in and meddling because the way that people identify with characters and with the different themes going on in a story when an author comes comes back five years 10 years 15 years 20 years later and fiddles with things and changes things you do get that uproar from people who say well that's not that's not actually the character. I know that character because that's the character that I know because I grew up with that character. And now you've changed that character. The Han shot first thing for me is the, the most fascinating example of, of uh, uh, an author actively alive who is working on his grand epic over the course of his lifespan. It's not being written and and you know, completed in this short time span, but it's also being done in, in a public space. So Tolkien, as an example, uh, I think that maybe the difference between Tolkien and George Lucas is that Tolkien would go in and do things in the era before social media and in the era before films and television and everything else. And so he was doing things in a vacuum. And so when he would get something finished, it would go to the publisher, they would publish that, and then years would go by as he was behind the scenes tinkering with things saying, well, I don't like the way that worked. I don't like the capitalization of those. I'm creating more languages, you know, more words. I'm creating a richer history for the legendarium. Now we're going to come back. And one of the things that got me started on this conversation was, and this is going to be a separate video. So hopefully you'll stick around with me as I continue to, you know, look into these topics. One of the things that's fascinated me in recent weeks is this idea that some people have put forward that the Numenorians were eight feet tall superhumans and that the depiction of them in the Rings of Power show was completely wrong. And that got me, you know, interested in this because I've never read, you know, History of Middle Earth, War of the Jewel, all these supplementary books. My knowledge of the Lord of the Rings ends with the Silmarillion. And the last time I read that was 20 years ago, which is why you know, what I'm doing right now with the, the Mondays in Middle Earth show at, on Monday mornings at 11 a.m. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Don't forget to tune in. Um, I'm reading, I'm in the Return of the King right now as I'm doing this reread of, of everything I read before 20 years ago. Um, you know, the supplementary material that was written 
and was largely in note form. And then Christopher Tolkien took those notes and started to put them together into a cohesive format and publish them over the years. You have a lot of people who have looked at those notes and have said, well, those notes are canon. And I don't actually have that opinion. Um, I think canon ends with the Lord of the Rings. That's where, you know, that's where the books that Tolkien worked on while he was alive finished. Everything after that is the tweaking is the, you know, and the, the similar one is slightly different because it was mostly completed. And he's talked a lot about that you know, in the letters and everything else. And it was mostly in a completed form. And, and Christopher was just able to kind of get that all together and get that published. Um, but one of the things we've seen throughout, not just the summer alien, but all the histories of middle earth and everything else is the notes, the various notes and everything. And if you go back and look through as an example, this idea that the Numenorians were eight feet tall and, and all this other stuff, you start diving into the history of who the Numenorians were and their characteristics and their history. And they lived for this long. And, and this is a really good example here. Other versions of the legendary it says in the earliest drafts of the Alcalabeth, Akalabeth, I forget how to pronounce this, it's introduced the notion of the Numenorians using aerial craft. After the destruction of their island, they devised ships that sail in the air of breath, but these mechanics are not explored and was discarded in the story later. Christopher Tolkien noted that Tolkien developed his thinking on the longevity of Numenorians. Originally, he suggested that not all of the line of Elros lived for 200 years. Those not of the line of Elros lived for 200 years, or three times Norman with royal kindred living 400 years, and then that was tweaked over and over and over and over. And it was never really finished. It was something that he was continually tweaking during his lifetime, right? So that's, to me, that's a fascinating component. Because this idea that the, you know, they were eight feet tall. I mean, by the way, I've not found anything to concretely confirm that. It says that Elendil was the tallest and he was seven foot 11. The average was six four. Um, we're going to be diving into that in another episode, so I don't want to spoil that here. I want to kind of get back, though, to what I was talking about is because what is fascinating me about this conversation is the idea that Tolkien, if he were alive today, doing what he notoriously did over the years, which was constantly fiddle with his great work right over the course of his lifetime i look at the way george lucas was reviled by a certain subset of the fans for doing the exact same thing and i think tolkien would be reviled by a certain subset of the fans if he were alive today because people don't like it when you mess with their interpretation of a story um the han shot first thing has always just been a fascinating thing to me especially as i've gotten older because when i was younger when i was younger i was definitely in the camp of no 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 mr lucas no han shot first that's not my han solo that's no 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 that's when i was younger the adult version of me 20 some years later understands, appreciates, and has given credit to George Lucas because the younger me was a reactionary little punk who didn't know any better. Um, you know, when the enhanced editions came out, I was, what were those? I was, would have been 17 when they came out in theaters. I don't remember, was it 97 or 96 when the enhanced editions came out. So I would have been 16, 17 years old. And I remember going to the theaters and seeing them and being like, oh, no. Um, but um, I wasn't a writer then. I didn't have the experience that I have now at 42. And, and where I am now, having spent long years working on various projects, you know, the saga of Lucimi as an example being something that I've, I've worked on for more than a decade. Um, the Weave in the Void now we've been working on for two years almost um, when you start working on things for great periods of time over the scope of the time that it takes to create something there are going to be dozens to hundreds of notes that are taken and those notes are going to impact the way things work and sometimes you're going to put something out in the public right 
you're going to publish something, and then you're going to be working on the follow-ups, and you're going to have an idea, and it's going to, oh, wow, that's better. No, and not only that, but now that allows me to do this, and then I can tie this in, and I can do this, which is what I kind of thought I was doing in the beginning, but I wasn't sure of how I was going to do it, and now I know how I could do it. So now i got to go back and revise that first book, where I have to revise that first thing to make it fit into the scope of what's going on with this greater body of work. Uh, the, the Dark Tower series by Stephen King is another really good example because that was written over the period of like 30 years, right? I think is the time frame more or less. I mean, the first book was, I think, in what, the 70s or I don't even know. I've only read it through once. I just know the first version was written a long time ago and then the most recent was not so long ago. And I remember reading through The Dark Tower and going, oh my God, there's a huge difference in his writing style between this book, this book, and this book because such huge periods of time had changed. And then he also has written in the notes, like he went back and changed components of the earlier tales because as he got older as a writer and had written other works and come up with other ideas and then decided that he was going to create this big universe where, you know, the man in black was, was, you know, in different universes as, as the same bad guy, the same malevolent force that was showing up in multiple different incarnations that impacted the story. And so he was going back and tweaking. And I know a lot of people have taken offense to that. It's the George Lucas thing. You can't mess with something that people have established as canon in their eyes. But here's the thing. If you're not the creator of the intellectual property, or you're not the owner of the intellectual property, but more specifically, the creator of the original. Um, the only person who gets to establish what is canon or not is the original author. Anyone who comes after, their their opinion is invalid and, and moot. Canon is established by the original author. And that original author has the right, the absolute, the only authoritative right, to change things within that body of work as long as they feel like changes are needed. And at some point, they will get to the point where that work is considered finished. In other cases, that might not happen because they pass on before they finish what they're working on. But it does raise an interesting question about whether or not Tolkien would be allowed the leeway to fiddle the way he did if he were doing so in the current era that we live in where outrage and everything has become the norm and you have all these, you know, the hate mongers and, you know, the, that's not my Han Solo. That's not my Obi-Wan. You know what I mean? Like people who get outraged over perceived changes to a character that they don't agree with um, because they feel like they own that character because of whatever association they have with it. Um, and in some cases, it might be justified. You know, as an example, I happen to love the Obi-Wan show. I think the storytelling there was great, what they did with the character. A lot of people don't agree. You have a lot of people who absolutely hate the Disney era Star Wars. I am not one of those people. I love all Star Wars. And so for me, even though I think that the Disney era Star Wars is different than the George Lucas era Star Wars, I think that it is still Star Wars. And for me, it's still something that I'm going to... Um, be enthusiastic about and appreciate. I might not view it in the same light as I view George Lucas's Star Wars, but he sold it. He gave them permission to do what they want to do, um, and to me, that's good enough. Um, it's 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 a weird thing where um, you know people look at that and say, "Well, that's not mine. That's not my version of Star Wars. I'm not going to participate in it." And that's that's definitely your right to do, but. I also see those same people going back 20 years being extremely upset at George Lucas for the changes that he was making to characters when he was revising his vision and making edits and changes to things and revising them. And I just I have to think that if Tolkien were alive today and doing the same thing, you would see the same outrage and you would see all these people who would, you know, it, it would be the same people who right now are making all these claims about the legendarium and what the rings of power has done with their adaptation i feel like a lot of those people would be the same ones who would be crucifying tolkien if he were to go back and start making sweeping changes to his books 30 years 40 years after they were published to say well you know what my worldview has changed 
I'm actually going to make these characters different. I'm going to make this history different. I'm going to change this. Aragorn is... I'm, I'm giving an, a stupid example here because I want to exaggerate for the purpose of entertainment. But it would be like if he came back later on and said, you know what? Aragorn did this, that, and the other. I'm not going to change it. Aragorn's going to have a ex-wife who died and now he has a son and this son is this this and this and and he's going to have that son leak going into the relationship with arwen and that's going to affect that relationship in this way because this this worldview that i have which has changed in 30 years has allowed me to create this better version of the history and you would have this outrage from a whole bunch of fans who would go no you know, Aragorn was never married. He never had a previous relationship. Arwen was the only one. She was the only one for Aragorn. It was prophesied and, you know, all this other stuff. You would have people who would be outraged over the littlest thing if Tolkien were to make changes like that. So I think it's just a fascinating case study um, into looking at how other authors and creators have been treated by the fan base when they make changes to a work over a large period of time. Um, Doing it in a public setting versus the way Tolkien was doing it back in the day, which was very much in a in a private setting, in a bubble, and then people would just get changes to the, you know, published works as new editions came out. Um, you know, he retconned The Hobbit. He retconned. He retconned a lot of stuff over over his lifespan. Um, yeah, I don't think it would be tolerated. I, I think you would have a, a huge group of people who would be, you know, making ranty videos on the internet about how Tolkien was off his rocker and that's not my that's not my lord of the rings <laughs> hashtag not my lord of the rings i don't know if you got to the end hopefully uh, you like this enough to like subscribe hit that bell icon support the channel like all of these amazing people on a premiere like this you could down there i'm in the chat with you guys you can ask me questions chitter chatter ask whatever you want hang out do super chats and stickers to support during the live streams after the fact you can do a super chat you can also join as a member of the adventures guild there's three different tiers of membership here on youtube and of course as always don't forget i do a lot of live streaming here you can show up on a live stream there is a patreon page if you want to get involved with my fantasy series that i have with my wife and my brother we're a couple years in now there's a book series a point click adventure game and a fifth edition tabletop setting which we stream every sunday night thanks everybody see you next time happy reading